Right, well, thank you very much, everyone. That's uh, the 23rd meeting of 2019. I was going to say 1919, sorry. 2019 um, of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. And um, so I'm welcoming everyone here today. Agenda item one uh, for the committee is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, and that will be to, take, um, to agree to take agenda item three in private. It's an, an item to discuss some correspondence we have received as a committee. Do members agree to take this item in private? Agreed. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Neil. Yeah. I prefer these things to be in public as a matter of, mm -hmm. um, as a kind of default position. I don't think there's anything that we shouldn't be discussing in public. And, mm -hmm. uh, I certainly would prefer that. Right, OK. Um, and we'll certainly discuss that later and then come back to the next meeting, if that's OK with you. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. Perfectly reasonable. Um, OK, agenda item two relates to the Scottish Elections Reform Bill and um, is for the committee to take evidence on uh, that bill. And joining us today in the first panel is Dr James Gilmore, who has kindly um, provided us with a submission on his, um, his ideas. And welcome, Dr Gilmore. And we'll move straight to questions from the members, if that's OK with you. Uh, it's great. And uh, Maureen, uh, would you go first, please? Maureen Watt. OK, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Dr Gilmer. Um, I wonder if you could briefly talk us through your research on the uh, list order effect and the key conclusions that you've come, for, come to, just uh, for the uh, record. How long have you got? <laughs> we could have a whole day seminar taking the five research papers apart, but we'll not do that. Uh, I did say briefly. <laughs> But thank you for the opportunity <coughs> to answer your questions in person. The, re the list order effect is very real. And there is no question that where a party nominates two candidates, the upper candidate receives a greater proportion of the first pa that party's first preference votes and has greater electoral success. Similarly, where a party nominates three candidates, a greater proportion of the party's first preference votes go to the high, high candidate, a, the lower, a lower proportion go to the middle candidate, and a smaller proportion go to the bottom candidate. So these effects are very real. There are a number of complicating factors. Incumbency plays a part if when you, try, when you disentangle what is going on. Um, sex, the sex of the pairs of, the, of, of candidates has no effect. The, uh, the effect, if it's male-male, male-female, female-female, female-male, or female-female, there is no effect of that whatsoever. There is, of course, severe underrepresentation of women, but that's a completely separate issue. <clears throat> In, as far as incumbency is concerned, did a very interesting exercise as a response to a targeted consultation from the Scottish Government in which the candidates were order, uh, were, uh, names were ordered alphabetically from A to Z. And they were separated into incumbents and non-incumbents. Where the... Uh, where the candidates were incumbents, the alphabetical position had no effect whatsoever. 85% of the first, of, we, we grouped the candidates in, uh, into 10 alphabetical groups. And the first, the first group, 85% of them were elected. The last group in the alphabet, 86% of them were elected. There was no effect whatsoever um, in the, uh, among the incumbents. There, was, however, if there were, however, effects among the non-incumbents, and there was a surprise in that the second alphabetical group, not the, not the first alphabetical group, but the second alphabetical group, were overrepresented, and the last al alphabetical group were significantly underrepresented. Now, there may be complicating factors there. It may be that a party that in that particular election was particularly popular had a disproportionate number of its candidates in the second alphabetical group, 
and conversely, a party that was not particularly popular at that particular election had a disproportionate number of its candidates in the last alphabetical group. So the, there are, the, among incumbents, there are no effects. Among non-incumbents, there are effects of alphabetical position. But the biggest effects of all are in terms of party pairs and party threes. Uh, and Neil, sorry, oh, thank you. The electoral commission, I think it was their paper, said there's no effect. Do you 100% disagree with that? No, uh, I mean, the, they, 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 the work that the electoral commission were asked to do by the Scottish government was on an extremely narrow remit. They were looking at two designs of ballot papers and they were asked to do a particularly one very specific thing, look for one particular candidate who stood alone for that party. And that, that's an extremely narrow remit. Yeah. I've read the report. I've also read the Ipsos Mori research report on which the Electoral Commission's report was based. And you're, you're quite right. The, the, there was overall very little effect of the ordering of the candidates. The surprising, the, the most surprising finding of all that work was how few of the voters, the test voters, recognized that the ballot paper ordering was alphabetical. Now that, that was an amazing, an amazing uh, finding. Mm. Yeah. Um, and in terms of what's happening elsewhere, um, to in other countries, other jurisdictions, to um, address this issue. What, what have you seen in terms of um, good practice elsewhere that tries to um, level the playing field, if you like, on this issue? I'm not aware of any uh, other legislation, that, uh, legislature that uses STV taking any positive steps to address this issue at all. None. But, but, but not, not in there, in, uh, there is a, I have a detailed paper um, which is not part of one of the submissions, but if you wanted to see it, I willingly make a copy available. One of the research papers that, that I, re I referenced, uh, where in the Republic of Ireland, there is very little evidence of alphabetical advantage. And in, the Republi in, in Malta, where STV is used for the parliament and for the local council, there is, it, it's neg there's a negligible effect. Mm -hmm. uh, neg and they have, if you take the parliament, they have five member constituencies and the parties nominate up to 21 candidates for a five member constituency. <coughs> when they can't, the maximum number of seats they could possibly win would be five. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different political culture yeah. from ours, but given the larger numbers of candidates, the greater choice the voters have, the alphabetical effects that we see in Scotland seem to disappear. And so finally, I suppose, um, if you were, if you had the freedom to design the system, what would you do in order to try and, um, if you like, level the playing field? It fits with part of, <coughs> part of my other submission, which is about increasing the ward sizes and stopping the use of by-elections to fill casual vacancies. So you would not do anything about list order other than increase the number of candidates? Personally, no, because of the downsides. There is a very, as I said in one of the, in the written submission, there is a very simple solution, and that is complete randomization. Mm -hmm. That's the only effective, totally effective solution there are major problems uh, pra uh, in terms of list order. There are major problems with all the other potential solutions. Mm -hmm. The problem with any approach like randomization or even the A to Z and Z to A that was suggested is voter confusion and disability problems. And in some cases, I mean, there's something that has not been probed. If a, 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 a group of voters with a specific disability is sufficiently disadvantaged by not having the appropriate um, 
appropriate access to accessible information as defined in the Equality Act, then that might amount to a legally recognised discrimination, and that would have very serious consequences for, for the whole legislative programme. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Maureen, first, and then Tom. Thank you. We, we tend to talk about this in terms of electoral process. Has anyone done any uh, research into how the parties manage it? So, for example, do parties target a particular part of the ward with one person's candidate's name and um, in another area another candidate's name? There so has anybody looked at it from how the parties organise themselves in relation to this? There are leaflets from probably the 2007 elections where the, a party nominated three candidates and suggested different order voting, one, two, three, three, two, one, two, one, three, in different parts of the ward and actually named the, the communities in the different parts of the ward where they suggested doing that. Um, parties are not as successful as an, in dragooning or persuading their support, potential supporters to do what they like. Um, of, the, of those who give a first preference to one of a party's two candidates, only 80% give a, a second preference to the, to the other candidate of the same party. So the parties, if they were trying to you know, maximise their support to get people to vote 1-2 one, two, or 2-1, two, the, there's quite a big gap, there's a 20% loss. Similarly, when there are um, three candidates, of those who give a first preference to any one of the three, only 80% give a second preference to, what, to one of the remainders, and only 70% mark all three. So there's a 20% loss between the first and second preference, and a further 10% loss between the first, second, and the third preference. So the in terms of parties maximising the support, um, the, they've got quite a lot to learn. The parties have been made, made aware by me of, the re, of these results, and they've been sent copies of various papers with, uh, with an offer to follow up, but none of them ever has. Okay, thank you. And Tom Mason, please. Yes. Dr Gilmore, do you, uh, I get the impression at the moment that the, 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 there's... We're worrying a bit too much about the, the order effect, apart from the, the dis, dis, disenfranchised, dis, disabled or disadvantaged people. Um, I'm to understand that really, in, in order to get a grip of this subject totally, we need far more re research, in other words, for jumping too quickly to any conclusion at, at this stage. I don't know if you need more research. I mean, I <coughs> think you, your, your first remark might be right, that we're worrying about it far too much. As somebody said, in one of the, uh, earlier dis your earlier discussions, it's not, a matter, it's not an issue for the voter. It is an issue for some of the parties and, for, and obviously for some of the candidates, depending if your name is A or Z. Um, so, but so we may have it out. We, we mustn't get the thing out of proportion. The effect is very real. My, part of my solution would be looking at what has happened, what happens in the Republic of Ireland and in Malta if we increased the number of candidates that parties were standing, the effect would probably diminish. The alphabetical effect would diminish. And I would recommend that we do increase the number of candidates that are likely to stand by increasing the ward sizes significantly beyond the proposal in the bill, and also by abolishing by-elections so that parties are encouraged to nominate more candidates at the ordinary election, so that they've got some, if you like, spares to fill the uh, casual vacancies when they come along. Because the evidence is quite clear from Malta and the Republic of Ireland that where there are significantly larger numbers of candidates, this effect disappears. There's also a small amount of evidence from from uh, the analysis of the Scottish results, in that the, uh, the proportion of votes going to uh, the upper candidate 
was quite high in three-member wards where there were only four candidates. It was a split was something like 70-30. But where there were four or five candidates in a three-member ward, in, well, five-member candidates, the split fell to 60-40. And it stayed like that right the way down as the number of candidates went up. So just the number of candidates of any party has an effect a beneficial effect on, on reducing the alphabetical bias be, uh, in, elect, in allocation of first preference votes as between party pairs. Working on the general principle that simplify and exaggerate is what you do with, 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 a, with a for, for any formula. Um, are we not in a position now, what you're really saying, if I understand it right, the bigger the number of candidates, the less problems we have with almost any, everything. But does this not, the, the, the limit to that or the extreme of that is why have any wards at all? Why not well, just have a, a general uh, sort of one, one city wide election? Yeah, th that is possible. Um, I would suggest that it, uh, it wouldn't be very practical to have an election for f 63 councillors yeah. or 58, 59, whatever the number is today, um, for the city of Edinburgh. Uh, and you, from looking at it from the voter's point of view, there are two, not conflicting, but two factors that have to be taken into account. One is, I feel like, a city-wide one, which is about representation, about proportional representation. And the more, uh, uh, the more members you elect together, the greater the representation you will succeed, you, you will obtain, because if you've got 59 councillors, for example, it is possible that 59 different groups could each win one seat and be represented. In the present partisan nature of our politics, that is unlikely to happen, but it is possible. But the proportionality across whatever groups are represented would be greatly increased if you elected them all together. However, from a voter's point of view, there is another aspect, and that is a, requ a requirement or a, a demand, a requirement for local representation, that it is inappropriate that I, who live in the south side, should be related to somebody who lives uh, in, in Leith or, or in, the north, in the northwest of the city. So there is, a, there is this, it's not a conflict, it, it's a balance between the localism of representation and the city-wide representation. And so you, 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 you balance the two between them. But I would, my, in my submissions, I have made the point that in the densely populated cities, the four main cities, and in some of the other densely populated urban areas, there's the present the present threes and fours are quite ridiculous, and even the government's proposed limit of five is far less than it could be. It's seven in Northern Ireland, and I don't see why in a city like Edinburgh or Glasgow it shouldn't be eight or nine. Does that not lead on to the fact that the, the, the conflict going on there is, is, is in fact the system of uh, transferable voters we have for local government not the right system. We should be looking for some other form of voting system. No, not at all. I mean, th this is one of, the, one of the joys of the single transferable vote, that it is so completely flexible. If you wanted to elect all 59 councillors in one single election, STV is perfectly capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> in, in, I, I supervised an election in Iceland where there were 550 candidates for 25 places on a national council where the entire island was the electorate. So it, it's an extremely flexible system. On the other hand, if you, if for good practical reasons, as perhaps in some islands, the sensible size of the ward is only two, STV proportional representation works perfectly well there as well. It's, it's one of the most flexible uh, uh, voting systems there is, and it's got very flexible implementation. One of the one of my concerns is that in recent, since STV was introduced for local government in Scotland, they've taken a very constricted, a very restricted view of what it could be. And I, I drew your attention to the 
education authorities of the 1920s, where a, a much more a, a, a much more open view, a, a, a much more voter-centered view was taken of what, what were, were reasonable ward size, what well, ward sizes, district elect, uh, electoral districts. But if you have these large numbers, does it do not lose the connection between the constituent and the councillor, because they're, they're representing so many people? No, I, do, I don't think so, <clears throat> because... It, it does depend, of course, to some extent on how the councillors get on. I mean, if they all, if they, if they don't, if they won't work together at all. I live in a four-member ward, where, of, and four different parties have are currently represented, and have four different parties, not the same four parties, have been represented at every every STV election. The councillors in my ward work as a team, and work and pick up the. One of them picks up the issues for a particular uh, alphabetical group of, uh, elect of, of electors and, and, and deals with it, provided it is a non-partisan matter. And if it's a partisan matter, I know which of my four ward councillors to go to. And on other occasions... The four councillors, some of them are in the administration and some of them are in the opposition or the scrutiny. And so, again, there's advantages in, the, in doing that. And so you can, you can relate to individual councillors uh, uh, or, or you can relate to a team of councillors. It, it, there's effective means. But, of course, if people don't want to make the system work, if the councillors who are elected don't want to make it work, well yes, then they will stop it from working. But that's not what the voters are looking for. Thank can you. we have one more? Sorry, Tom, can we let Gillen in this? Yes, sir, yeah. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, did I pick you up right uh, uh, in regards to the research? Did you say that you, uh, or in regards to the list order, that you were researching on behalf of the Scottish Government? Or did I pick that up wrong? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Did, did, in your introduction, uh, did you say that you, some of your research was for the Scottish Government? None of thing, nothing I've done no, for the fine. Scottish Government at all. Okay, but I have, I have used the research that I have done in making responses to a whole variety of consultations on these issues okay. to the Scottish Government at their, at their, at their various... OK, thanks yeah. for that. Um, in regards to the evidence that you've provided... Um, and we're aware of the, the uh, proposal that's been put to us in regards to people who may have some difficulty uh, if it wasn't alphabetical. But the evidence that you gave us would suggest that nobody uses the alphabetical system because they go to the first person registered for that party on the ballot paper. I have no specific evidence on it, but looking at the data as a whole, the conclusion you might come to is that the majority of voters vote by party, and they probably therefore look for the party emblem, and they read most of them read the, the ballot paper from the top down, and so they look down the, look down the list until they see the, their chosen party emblem, and they put one there, and then they look for the other one and put two there. You're very perceptive. That was going to be my next question. I mean, there, I'll, I'll, I'll there, maybe come back to that, but just to, to stick to that point. So what, what, if you look at the numbers then, then the numbers would suggest that al <coughs> the alphabet doesn't come into the equation at all because the numbers that you've expressed and the numbers that we've already had would suggest that people go to the ballot paper and the, the first choice is the first person for that party at the top of the list, no matter what the name is. It, there's interesting results from where there are party threes. <coughs> if the first preference is for the, the, high, the high candidate out of the three, the majority of the second preferences go to the middle candidate and not the bottom one. <coughs> if the first preference is for the bottom candidate, the majority of the second preferences go to the middle candidate, 
and the smaller number go to the top candidate. If the first preference is for the middle candidate of the three, those voters split evenly. Half of them go up the ballot paper and half of them go down. So it depends how you choose to read the ballot paper, from the top to the bottom or from the middle. For that. Okay, I, and just uh, the follow-up on quite quickly. Uh, uh, and, and so the other part of you, you've, all, I think, already given the answer, but just to be clear for the record, so did, did you did, did you carry out any research in regards to how people make their journey to vote? Do they, in fact, go to the party first and then pick from the party list? I have no, I have no uh, research on that, on that. whatsoever. Okay. The only. The research I, I have done is based on the published electoral results and the, from the unique uh, repository of ballot data that we have in Scotland. It's a unique resource. And so I look, analyse what voters actually did. How they did it, I don't know. Why they did it, I don't know. The work that Ipsos Mori did for the Electoral Commission commissioned by the Scottish Government, that gives you some idea of how the, uh, some of the voters looked at the ballot paper. The eye-tracking work showed how, how they looked at the ballot paper, what they looked at first and what they looked at last. But it doesn't tell us anything about why they did what they did. That would require be, uh, research in behavioural psychology, which is quite difficult and very expensive, especially if you want to make it quantitative, which to try and get behind what's in these figures, I think you would ha have, to have to do. But on the other hand, you may well say, well, yes, some of the parties are very agitated about uh, alphabetical effects and the fact that by an occasionally more of their upper placed candidates out of pairs get elected than the lower one. But as far as the vote is concerned, this isn't an issue and we're, we're agitating about it too much. Um, certainly when you take all the downsides of making any of the effective changes, and you've got to remember if you, if you use the, the, there's a very important point about the uh, A to Z, Z to A, that if uh, I were a candidate uh, for a party that nominated three candidates in my ward, one was A, one was Z, and I'm G, and the government was determined to use A to Z and Z to A papers, I would think I would have a very strong case for judicial review. Because while they are, deliber they are deliberately manipulating the paper to remove a bias as between A and Z, that what they're doing is permanently disadvantaging me in the middle. And I would think that's a discrimination and I would have a call for judicial review. I would certainly want to ask. Thank you very much. That's introducing another interesting yeah. angle. We haven't got time for it, unfortunately. Um, and Mark, a uh, final question, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, was just, I, was, I was struck by your comments about multi-member wards and having uh, potentially administration and opposition councillors within the same ward. I think there's a, you know, a constructive tension uh, in that situation, having been a, a councillor myself in a very similar situation. Um, I was just going to wrap up, though, by asking you uh, again just to reflect a bit more on your proposal around scrapping by-elections. Um, I mean, can you say a bit more about uh, your, your, your thoughts on recounting the original vote? Um, I mean, I can, I can just see a few kind of issues there in terms of the length of time between the original vote and the by-election, the impact on parties, for example, that may only put forward one candidate in that original election then would be perhaps removed from any, any on, subsequent to pick kind of reallocation. Up on your, your very last comment first, that's the whole point. Where a, where a party thinks in an ordinary election it will win only one seat, they play safe mm -hmm. and they nominate only one candidate and it's got to be a man or a woman. There's no diversity of representation at all. Firstly, increase the ward sizes so that party might well win two seats okay. and then it has to nominate a team of two. And the parties that don't, that nominate nothing but men, 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 they will stand out like sore thumbs and can be dealt with through, the, through political social campaigning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With regard to by-elections, the point about a, a 
point about not holding a by-election to fill a casual vacancy, but instead going back and counting again the original ballot papers, you've got to have a spare if you think there is a, if you want to take advantage of, you've got to have a spare on your, your candidate, one, at least one more than you expect to win at the ordinary election. Mm -hmm. So that if a by-election, if, if a casual vacancy arises and the original ballot papers are counted again, your party has a candidate of, who wasn't elect, previously mm -hmm. elected available to take that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that standard practice in Tasmania <coughs> has been for decades. It's also standard practice in Malta. Mm -hmm. Malta n not only does f fills, if you like, ordinary casual vacancies uh, by that means, they, ha they have a provision that we would not, well, I certainly wouldn't look favourably on, and that is they allow candidates to stand in several constituencies, and significant numbers of them do, but you can be a member of parliament for only one constituency. Mm -hmm. So if you are successfully elected in several constituencies, as some of them are at each election, they then have to decide which constituency they will represent, and they stand down in the others. There's an immediate casual vacancies. There is an immediate by-election, and the by-election is conducted by counting again the ballot papers. Mm. Okay, so and that um, applies equally if the casual vacancy arises halfway through the life of the parliament. Yeah. Uh, they, they will go back to the ballot papers. So you're saying that that would work best then in, in a situation where you have much larger multi-member wards. If you have larger multi-member wards, parties to put forward multiple candidates. So the, then you could rely the, on your backups. There are to come two. In. There are two interacting factors here. One is have larger wards where where such wards are practicable, mm -hmm. and give an a guidance instruction to the electoral com to the boundary commission to maximise the size of wards alongside the parity. As as as, as I made a note there. Um, to do that, and that increases the teams, but then to increase the team even further, do away with by-elections for casual vacancies so that parties will nominate a bigger team and include a spare or two spares in, in their team in case a by-election arises. Mm -hmm. And that then <coughs> removes two of the structural barriers that there are at present to diversity, because where, where the uh, parties are nominating small teams, or in many cases only one candidate, there is no opportunity for diversity. And the biggest lack of diversity we have at the moment is in men and women. Women are 52% of the electorate. 23% of the candidates at one of the elections were women. 24% of the councillors elected were women. So there is a long way to go if this parliament is serious about addressing the diversity, representing the diversity of the electorate properly in our local, in our local yeah. government. Addressing it properly in the parliament is a job for another day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. That was very useful. Um, sorry, there are other questions, but we actually have two panels on today and we don't have any more time, unfortunately. But Dr Gilmore, I think that's been extremely interesting and very, very worth our while, actually. If you have other questions, mm -hmm. please don't hesitate to ask the clerks to send them to me. Sure. And I can write them up, for, write, give, provide answers to them. Um, and it's for you then to decide whether they become public or not, whether you want them handled as part of a public submission yeah. or a private submission. I, I can do that for you. That's very kind of you. And thank you very much for all your time. Thank you. So we'll just um, have a wee changeover at the moment. Uh, thank Dr Gilmore for his very interesting contribution uh, to our thoughts. Um, and we will be moving on to the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans, Graham Day, in a moment or two. OK.
just let you settle slightly. Um, so, thanks very much to Dr. Gilmore for the first panel. In the second panel today, uh, we have Graham Day, MSP, Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans. And uh, joining him are Alison Fraser, Ian Hockenhall, and Maria McCann. Welcome to you all. Um, so, what we'll do, um, if it's all right with yourself, because we want to make sure we can get as much through as possible, is we'll move straight on to questions. And uh, Maureen Watt, please. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Minister and panel. Um, I know in the policy memorandum that the proposal to change terms to five years is, quote, not the settled preference of Scottish ministers. So can I ask specifically, do you support a change to five-year terms? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of increasing the length of terms from four years to five years? So the more I've reflected uh, on this, the more I've come to the view that five years ought to be the direction of travel. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, in no particular order, five years has actually become the norm in the Scottish Parliament over the last two elections. There's also the option, uh, or, or there's the issue where if you project forward for the next 15 years or so, if we were in four-year terms, there are two potential clashes would arise. Um, and as you know, clashes are neither desirable um, nor are they um, not without challenge in terms of having to legislate to try and avoid some of those. I think this is a tidier approach. Um, <clears throat> around clashes, you, you could get into a situation, if those did arise, where you would have two different electoral systems at play. And in 2007, we saw the difficulties that arose from that uh, with uh, issues around um, spo uh, spoiled uh, ballot papers. Um, you also don't want to get into a situation, I think, situation, I think where council elections are overshadowed, are overshadowed by national elections when they're important in their own right. <coughs> Wales and Northern Ireland have moved to five-year terms. There are other countries like France and Ireland uh, have done that. There are cost savings implications for five-year terms. We estimate that five-year terms for both sets of elections would save in the region of £37 million over the next 20 years. Um, so there are a number of, of uh, things that, that lead me to, to the view that five years would probably be the preferable option. Um, but I recognise there's a range of views and um, you know we'll, we'll see how we take this forward. Okay. Um, and if these um, provisions in the bill are passed, will they take effect for the next scheduled Scottish Parliament elections in 2021? Um, and does that give electoral registration and administration sufficient time to implement any changes? So all of these things have been the subject of intense uh, discussion with the relevant stakeholders. We would follow the gold principle here with the, the six month uh, rule. I think off the top of my head, the, ca the, the likelihood here is we would lay uh, any relevant um, uh, in, uh, commencement materials in September with a view to, uh, under the affirmative process, with a view to those being passed by November, which would give them the, the period they're looking for. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maureen. Um, Gil Patterson, please. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, the bill would pro prohibit an individual from voting more than once in a local authority elections held on the same day. The bill does not prevent someone from appearing on more than one electoral <coughs> register. Is the policy enforceable when dual registration is allowed? And how uh, could voting more than once be detected in the first place? Well, a lot of questions in there. Um, can, we, can I get some background on this before I offer you that just now in the first instance, Ian? Uh, certainly. I mean, it, it is a feature of our system that we don't have one single register, uh, and therefore where you have students, for example, um, as a consequence of that, you have students typically either registered or registered either at home or at their university or <coughs> in both registers. Uh, and it's very difficult to police or establish whether all students should be voting at their university or all students should be voting at home. And we don't have that level of prescription in our system. We allow people to choose. So as a result, the system operates in that way. And underlying this is always the, 
the criminal law, which would penalise anyone who can't, tries to exploit the system by illegally voting twice. Um, and we don't have any evidence uh, of malpractice to that extent, or that the law is being flouted in that way. Um, if, a, if we were of a problem, then we could um, look at the issue to tackle it in that way. I, I think the, the bottom line is we don't, we've no evidence to suggest there's a significant problem here. It, we also have to, I think, be careful um, about our approach to not uh, create a disparity between um, the, uh, the situation between the UK and Scottish elections. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that, but I wonder how, I can't actually remember any kind of inquiry into uh, people um, voting twice. Uh, <coughs> I, I, I don't actually remember any research into that or hearing if, in fact, do we know if, if people are, if, if, do we know if people are, are, are breaking law and have we actually checked? The, the, the provision in the bill is not it's not um, accusing anyone of having broken the law in that situation. Yeah. It's, it's more of a, an issue that we put in our consultation paper uh, in 2017-2018, yeah. um, asking if this should be uh, continuing, because it's a, a little bit of an anomaly if we compare it to the position for other elections. Um, at a national level, you don't get two votes, whereas in the local government setting, if you share your residence between two locations, then you're able to vote in those two different locations, provided they're in different council areas. You can't vote <coughs> if they're in the same council area. Um, so the consultation question was essentially, should that practice continue? Not saying it was a wrong practice, but as an option, should that continue? And over 80% of the consultee respond respondents came back to say we should stop it. And the, the consultation analysis was strongly of the view, well, the flavour of the analysis was that it was on the one member, one person, one vote principle, that's what that should be the reason to stop it. But the, the government's resisting from making that change in the bill because we want to stay the same as the rest of the UK. The, the, the bill's making the change to remove um, being able to vote in two locations. So uh, I suppose to separate it out, it will now become, if the bill passes, it will become illegal to vote twice in one local government election in two different areas, just as it is in Scottish Parliament elections. It is possible yeah, to still be that. on two different registers, but you would have to choose which location to vote in, and you would be committing a criminal offence if you voted in both locations. Uh, and I think the maximum penalty is up to five thousand pounds. So, in the spirit of people saying, you know, one member, one vote, etc., would it not be just easier <coughs> just to have people only able to register in one one register? End of story. Would that not be? The solution to all this, and that that would, in effect, meet the demands of the 80% that you, because I think that's what they're telling us. Uh, part of it's a question of resource. Yeah. Um, you, you could establish a single national register and make people choose. So, you, for example, a student uh, at Aberdeen University who lives in Dumfries, they would have to choose whether to be on the Dumfries register or the Aberdeen register, and they may change to change their, choose to change their mind. You might have to think about putting in limits to say you can't change your mind more than twice a year or something like that. There are options there, but it's just a question of do we want to put the resource into to pursuing that? Of course, it would be required to, to, to do that. And it would also potentially, I say potentially, put students off voting if they were actually confined to only vote at home, say, for example. So there's a, there's a, there's a range of things here, and I think we're just taking a proportionate approach to this. Yeah, OK. Could, could it, the, the, proposal, the proposal would mean that someone could still vote in one area as a scheduled election and then in another in a by-election. And maybe if I could clarify a piece in here. Would it be possible, since there are two separate elections and they're quite common when it comes to local government elections, it's quite it, <coughs> almost every election I can remember, a by-election takes place somewhere in Scotland at the same time. So that if someone was registered in two areas uh, at the same time, would, they still, would it still be possible to vote in the uh, national election for local government and in the by-election in a different area? Would that still be allowed on the same day? Uh, that is an established feature of all levels of the UK electoral system. Um, it, I guess the issue historically is that it's not been considered to be enough of a problem to pursue. It is a feature of the system. Though. 
so it's but it, so that, that is allowable mm. under okay thanks very much for that thank you thank you well, thanks very much. Um, and uh, Gil, you've also got something about registration. Oh, oh my. <laughs> uh, the proposal to allow uh, attenders to register from the age of 14 has been welcomed. Uh, we have heard uh, a lot about how important it is also to educate young people in their electoral system. So we're looking at what, what the government, if, if this is going to happen, uh, and the uh, overwhelming evidence that we have got is that, that the people think that's a good idea. What is the government <coughs> going to do to uh, utilise uh, this new uh, uh, episode in people's lives, and how are we going to how are we going to achieve what we've, we've set out to do? Okay, I, I'm, I think you're right to make the point that it has been widely welcomed. I think it is it will make things a lot simpler. I actually sense tested this with a group of young people from my own constituency just last week and got a very positive response to it. In terms of, of how we raise awareness of this and, and, and that whole journey around political awareness, there is a political literacy strand to education at the moment. Um, there will also be lots of publicity to come involving the likes of Young Scott and the Scottish Youth Parliament to raise awareness around this. I mean, there's a much more detailed answer I could provide, but that, in the essence, is where we are. Um, so, there, essentially, there will be um, some follow-up work done here uh, to support this. And I, but I, I get the sense, I don't know about, about uh, the committee members, that young people are very much alive to, to politics now in a way that perhaps they weren't 20 years ago. They're very switched on. And certainly, as I say, when I sense-tested it last week with some 30 youngsters from my constituency, they were very much up for this and very much on the ball when it came to the political process. Yeah, I suppose the question is, Minister, I appreciate that point and I think I agree with you. Since the 2014 uh, referendum, the, the, the awareness within our young, young people is immense and it, right across the board, whether you're in favour or against, it's, that's not the question, that they are engaged. So, uh, the question is, will the government be putting in some resources to help the education authorities uh, uh, educate young people uh, on the process itself? I know it, to people that vote all the time, it's a fairly easy uh, process, but you do come across many people who uh, kind of worry about just uh, presenting and, and voting, as simple as it may well be. Well, I think the answer is that there is up to local authorities to um, they control the education system locally. Um, they, as part of that, they can tweak what they're delivering at the moment to explain to, to people the, the, the changes in the system. I, I don't think this is a, a massive deal. CFE um, is, is a vehicle for doing this. Um, so I would be pretty confident that this is not something that's going to require huge resources to raise awareness of. And as I said to you earlier, it won't just be anything that's coming through local or national government. There's also the work of Young Scott and the Scottish Youth Parliament. Uh, so I think we're covered, we might be. <coughs> uh, thanks very much for that. Just another question on resources um, or the availability of them. We've heard that uh, to, to keep the register up, up to date uh, is, is quite an onerous thing. And I wonder if the government's looked at that and what assistance that they might give to ensure that the, the register is, yeah, is is really resourced and kept up to date as best as it could be. In terms of resources? Yes. Um, well, certainly we're in dialogue with electoral professionals, the electoral commission, electoral registration officers uh, in relation to what, what's needed. Um, the bill makes provision for the electoral management board to get involved in <coughs> Scottish Parliament elections and the policy memorandum describes some additional funding that's been given to the Electoral Management Board in its coordination uh, role to help with its new powers for Scottish Parliament elections. Okay. Could I just add that um, in relation to improving registration that we've been working jointly with the uh, Westminster Government and the Welsh Government to bring forward a programme of canvas reform and that is to target resources um, to those who are underrepresented and to make it easier um, to um, 
to channel the resources appropriately. So we have been doing a lot of detailed work on that because, as you say, there is a real need to improve the, the registers and to get the underrepresented groups on. So we've actually bring forward an SSI in relation to this uh, shortly, and it's been a joint, a joint policy approach. Well, thanks very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just shortly from Mark as well, please, on that. Yeah, um, do, do you think that education of young people would be enhanced uh, if they could actually stand for election themselves? Um, are you, is that on a personal view you're seeking? Um, I think you well, have to come to... Official view from government would be fine, but a personal <laughs> view will suffice. Um, I, I, that, this is covered in the Franchise Bill, isn't it? I mean, I think this is an, an area you've teased out. I mean, it, it, I don't think... It, well, it, it's not covered in the franchise what? bill, but it could be, and it, it's a live discussion, I guess. So I'm, I am interested in your your view, personal or otherwise, yeah. on it. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think the position that we're taking at the moment is probably um, the, the right one, um, but I do recognise the argument that uh, around 16, 17 year olds voting, and then at what point can they stand? I think that's an ongoing conversation. But right now, I think we're in. We're in the right space. Okay. Thanks, Mark. And uh, please, can we move on to electronic voting and new? Yeah. What, um, <clears throat> what do you... What's your view of electronic voting? What do you foresee as being a system that we may look at? I, I think it's important I, I, um, to recognise or to define what we mean at this stage by electronic voting. I think there's an immediate presumption we're talking about online voting right here and now. I mean, what's envisaged, I mean, th th this works at a very early stage, but what's envisaged in the first phase is looking to address um, facilitating electronic voting in a central place not least of all to accommodate people with learning disabilities to make it easier for them. That's what's envisaged in the kind of, the, the kind of uh, first uh, phase of this. Now, of course, uh, we would, you know, the, the option to move to some sort of electronic voting system is always there, but there are all the security concerns and other concerns around that, and I think that's somewhere down the line. So I think essentially this is in the immediate term, to, to work with disability groups to try and address some of the concerns so that they saying, have. You're saying there's there's a phase of that work already under, ongoing. Um, is that a phase of work? There are, sorry, there are no firm plans right now for a pilot, but we, that's what we are moving to. Right, so... And that's what we have in mind. OK. So in terms of what's actually being done at the moment, is it you know, one hour a month of a civil servant's time? Is there a team? Is there a person? How far has this gone? I, well, a member of our, the elections team is looking at um, possible pilots. Uh, the main focus at the moment is on accessibility. And, it, and rather than transmission of a vote, it's more about securely and privately allowing someone with, say, a visual impairment to register their vote and then say bring it along to the polling station and have it uploaded in a way which no one else gets to see what how they're voting or so uh, to afford them privacy so there would be no electronic transmission in any of these pilot ideas that we're discussing or looking at at the moment so i say so someone would uh, say with a visual impairment would complete their ballot paper elsewhere and then come and upload it yeah, they would get uh, some sort of package at home that would allow them to pick and make their choice in a way that can then be communicated in a different way, that, but not crossing the internet so that no one else gets to see what they've Because my understanding, chosen. I was listening to radio the other day about people with a visual impairment and what they were making the point was that in whatever place they cast their vote at the moment, it's not a private. Um, so it would this... Would this allow them then to make a private decision? Yes, um, the proposal is the electronic delivery of their ballot paper. So it would be electronically delivered to them. Then they could use whatever readers they may use at the moment, because this is a very important aspect, because yeah. they can use it for so many other aspects of life. They'd be able to make their decision in private and no one else would would know we've still we've got a long way to go we're still working on all the detail of this um 
but uh, this was the thing that was uh, most pressing. Okay, um, and, uh, and just to be absolutely clear, we're talking about no remote um, voting electronically. It would be, we're at the initial stages of moving to a central location where you would cast your vote in some electronic format to be determined at a future date. Yeah. We haven't really, got, as I say, got down to the absolute detail on that. But in terms of the online voting, say voting from your phone or something like that, that's not being looked at at the moment. And um, <clears throat> what discussions have been had with um, other countries' um, electoral registration teams in terms of their experience of electronic voting? Well, two members of the team visited um, Estonia uh, recently uh, during an election, so um, they were able to see um, that whole process in action. The percentage of people voting online in Estonia has increased. It was quite low in the first time, about 20%, and it's gone up. I think it's in, um, heading towards half half the numbers. So uh, it is growing in popularity, but there's obviously the, the full traditional system was also available. And did, was there any... Um increase in participation from electronic voting? That's something that I, I don't know. I'd have to go and look and see if, that's, uh, if there's any research into that. Because um, presumably, I can understand the, um, the whole point of um, moving towards electronic voting for people with a visual impairment or other disability, but uh, presumably the point of electronic voting um, or historically it's been put forward is to increase participation. If it's not going to increase participation, then mm. what is the point? Well, we could write to you with the detail yeah. of the Estonian situation, okay. if that's helpful. Um, and finally, um, is there a, a role, do you think it would be a role for organisations like the Electoral Commission in reviewing um, any electronic voting and um, being involved? Yeah. It is our intention that that will be the case. That will require an amendment to Section 5 of the 2002 Act, but that is our intention. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, OK, just a um, couple of quick questions, please, about the role of the Electoral Management Board for Scotland. Um, the Electoral Management Board has asked the Scottish Government to, if you're open, uh, to future funding requests, so for example, local government posts need to be backfilled because of additional workload on those who hold dual ro uh, roles. Uh, would you be open to that kind of request in order to facilitate better working of the system? Uh, indeed, the, the, the dialogue um, will always be ongoing on this sort of thing. We have actually increased the funding as they requested currently. Mm -hmm. So to give you some numbers, <coughs> convener, the grant in 2018-19 was £78,700. In 2019-20, it was £100,600. And we've got an agreement on an estimate of £115,600 for 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and we would remain open to any valid approaches from them going forward. Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, in terms of Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland, um, the intention of legislation that we've been presented with is to allow for rolling reviews of the boundaries, um, but we've heard concerns that the bill as drafted would not allow for that if the term lengths were changed to five years. Uh, will you bring forward amendments at stage two to address this? Well, obviously it would depend on the proposed changes to term lengths to move to the five years um, being accepted. Um, as you say, the Commission has indicated they would want us in those circumstances to look at a review period of 15 years. Um, I'm reflecting on the Commission's views on that. Um, I am sympathetic, if I could put it that way, and I'll write to the committee in due course. Um, but I do think they, they make a reasonable case. Okay, thank you. And um, further uh, on that issue, uh, from Mark. Yeah, um, so, so the Commission... Uh, obviously allows flexibility to propose two and five member wards. But we noticed in the financial memorandum, it states that <clears throat> it's not envisaged that the total number of councillors for local government area would change as a result of a Boundary Scotland review. So I wanted to ask you for clarity as to, as to whether the Commission will be able to 
make a recommendation in relation to increasing or indeed de decreasing the number of councillors within a uh, within a within a council area as a result of a, a change in uh, in in ward. Okay, I'll, I'll numbers, get Maria to give you a detailed answer on that. Um, just to say that they would be able to do this. Um, uh, during the fifth round of reviews, I think they were working on the kind of working assumption that there wouldn't be vast changes in the number of councillors, but there were some changes proposed, yeah. and uh, my recollections they were accepted. So, yes, that's that's not meant to say that there would be any absolute ban which okay. imposed on the changes that they would be um, that would be allowable um, with that, yeah. you know. It would be accepted yeah. as okay. it was before. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm aware that there were some subtle changes yeah. as a result of the last review. But if that if that's the intention that that, that flexibility will remain going forward, that that's welcome to get that on the record. Um, can also ask about the the consideration that's been given to the change of proportionality that might come, particularly from uh, the introduction of a two member ward. We haven't actually looked at the proportionality um, issue. Um, that's obviously something that uh, is relevant, but it's not. It wasn't part of the consultation, um, and it's not been looked at specifically. There's quite a lot of aspects of the boundary uh, commission legislation that we we didn't look at. Um, you know, there was topics that were picked, and that wasn't one of them. Why why wasn't that that looked at? Um, to be honest, I don't. I wouldn't know the origins of of that, um, but it's something that could be looked at. Um, I, mean, I mean, it's a proportional voting system, so you know the the answers on the on on the, on the tin, really, isn't it? I suppose if you if you're going to look at changing the system, then why would mm. you not look at proportionality as part of that? But yeah, we'll come back to you on that. We'll write okay. back to you in detail. Okay. And then my last question is just, I guess this follows on from that really, um, is about how the whole multi-member proportional system is really working at the moment and whether there's scope for for review of that. Um, you know, you've maybe heard different views today uh, and previous evidence around whether the system's great, whether it's working well, whether it's optimised, whether, it, you know, uh, so, it, you know, perhaps opening up those areas would be, would be of interest, but... I don't know if that's something government wishes to do or not. Well, th th there is certainly no time in this parliament uh, to do that. But I, I am sympathetic to the point that you make, Mr Roscoe. The system has been in place now for some time. There are a range of views as to how effectively it works, and I don't express a view either way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's reasonable uh, to, to ask that in the next parliament such a review of its effectiveness might be taken forward. I think that would be quite appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can I just um, bring up something which is uh, mostly of uh, concern and genuine concern for candidates? Um, the requirement for parliamentary candidates' publication of their home addresses has been removed, which is perfectly logical and sensible in the current climate, and in any climate probably, but um, a local government elections uh, candidates' addresses still appear in electoral notices and ballot papers, and this seems um, this seems to be something which jars, and quite rightly, in my opinion. So what do you think yourself about that? Indeed, uh, convener. Um, the ministers have also made a public commitment through correspondence with Richard Lyle, MSP, to amend the requirement to publish candidates' addresses on local government uh, ballot papers. Um, and, and to be clear, that's an, that provides an option for if people want to continue doing that, they can. Um, the change does not need to be included in the bill. It could be addressed by uh, as part of the Local Government Elections Order 2022. However, I entirely agree with you. And that's why, um, with the possibility of by-elections, the probability of council by-elections to come, um, I'm going to undertake uh, to look at... We, whether we can bring forward an affirmative SSI in the new year that would address this quicker. Oh, that'd be, uh, well, thank you very much for that, because I think that's very important to many people. Um, can we ask uh, Tom Mason, please? Yes. Uh, the, um, raise the subject of first order effect on, on ballot papers, which is an issue, but it's not included in the bill. Do you have any particular plans to consider 
issues to do with first order effect on ballot papers? Yeah, I thought this might come up. Um, this is something obviously that provokes a great deal of discussion. Um, I've certainly reflected at, uh, on it at great length about the various options that are there. Um, I think the first thing to say is we all recognise the current system isn't perfect. But you don't make change simply for the, make, the, the sake of change. You need to change the system that is more effective, is more fair, is less biased, whatever. Um, so there's a lot of work, I think, requiring to be done to get into this in detail about the pros and cons of alternatives. So we've been considering, as you'll be aware, two options. One is drawing names by lot, and the other is having two ballot papers, A to Z, Z to A. We commissioned the Electoral Commission to look at this uh, in detail for us. Now, uh, we haven't reached any decisions now as to whether to adopt either of those changes or any others. Um, there, there, there are a number of pros and cons around any uh, option. Um, I think there is an argument for possibly testing the options in some local government by-elections to see what actually works in practice in a Scottish context. Um, but I agree with Bob Posner of the Electoral Commission that we should not rush into this and risk unintended consequences. And I don't say that to sit in the fence. I think we really need to get this right if we're going to make changes. Um, just because we believe that there are flaws in the present system, as I said, I don't think we should be uh, changing it simply for the, the, uh, the sake of it. Um, I know other people have a view about randomisation as an option. Um, we, uh, you know, just by way of background, we estimate that a, a randomisation process would add £2 million to the process of conducting the election, not to mention the administrative burden it would create. And I'm also trying to work through in my head um, uh, how you would have a system that didn't create another bias somewhere along the line by using randomisation, depending on did we, if you had 100% of ballot up, paper uptake, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there are some other issues around that to add further to the, the confusion. Um, you required currently to have a large printed sample of the ballot paper in the polling station to assist people at the moment with perhaps visual impairments. How could you have that if it was a randomised ballot paper? as opposed to one ballot paper, or one might say two ballot papers, if it was A to Z, Z to A. Um, and of course, you have other issues that arise around some local authorities still want to count manually at a by-election. So if you had multiple different ballot papers, you know, it would create a great deal of difficulty for them. I don't make these points to say, so let's not change it. I'm simply laying out, and I'm sure you've thought of this as well, some of the pros and cons of, of the options around this. So I take it that really the, the, the whole issue is really to do with a, a review of the whole electoral system that you've mentioned in the previous answer. It, it's about recognising that, the, that if one accepts there is a potential bias in the current arrangement, now, you don't necessarily have to accept that. You could argue that people go to the ballot paper and look for their party of choice or they look for the emblem. But there's a substantial piece of work um, we have had done about the time that people take using the various um, system approaches to get to the person <laughs> they want to get to. There, there has been a fair bit of work done on it, but none of it right now is absolutely conclusive in any direction. Thank you. Okay, and Neil, do you want to come in on that? You casually flung in a figure of £2 million there. Where do you get that from? Um, we asked suppliers um, in 2015 because we did look at this issue um, previously, um, what the costs, the additional costs would be in relation to the e-counting um, process. Now, uh, we just asked them to do an estimate for us, so we're not saying that, you know, we'd have, obviously have to go out to tender to get that verified, but we, we did do that work and, uh, for the last uh, local government elections when we were preparing the e-counting specification. I think when I finish up, I'll go into shuffling ballot papers for a living that seems to be a very profitable business. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, okay, and uh, can we move on to Mark Ruskell, please? Thank you. Um, <coughs> yeah, can I ask about the, the, the maximum fines that the Electoral Commission can impose? I mean, we heard the commitment 
from the Cabinet Secretary in relation to referendums to raise that to, to half a million pounds. Um, it sits at 20,000 at the moment um, for, for elections. Uh, is, there, is there a commitment to equalise that or, or another figure? You Name your figure. <laughs> I, I, we're, we're in discussion with the twenty minutes. We're, we're in, in discussion with the electoral commission on this, um, and certainly considering the options, and in light of the, the passage of the referendums bill or the, the, the progress that's had, the commission one of the figures they've mentioned is um, I think tied to the old powers of the UK Information Commission to levy fines of up to half a million pounds for right. data breaches. Um, so that was the figure they've proposed, but uh, we're in consultation with them. Okay. Anyone then, please, Mark, and Electoral Commission. Um, yes, yeah, so can I ask then just about the, the discussions that you've had with the Electoral Commission about extending powers um, to require uh, information and a, and a power to, to share information? Do you want to come in? That would obviously be an extension to the Commission's powers. Sure. There, there, we have looked at this as well. There are some limitations that we're able to do within the existing structure of the devolution settlement because the, UK, the Electoral Commission is a UK-wide body dealing with all elections mm -hmm. uh, and we think that there are too many limitations on exactly what we can do within the reserve matters. Um, there are some existing powers that the Commission have to obtain information um, but there are a number of issues that raise up where you they go further and it might be without with the scope of this Parliament to go too far. Okay. Okay. And I uh, can also ask about the payment regime for returning officers as well, whether that's something which you're looking at reviewing or... There are ongoing <laughs> discussions on that subject, right. um, which we hope will come to a satisfactory conclusion um, relatively soon. Okay. W will any changes be in place then for the, the 21 Holyrood elections? Yes. That's the intention. Okay. Do you, do you think if returning officers get it wrong, there should be... Any, any form of financial sanction. Uh, I mean, I was thinking back to an example uh, in the Glasgow Council elections in 2012, uh, where a ballot box simply wasn't counted, um, but a result was declared. Um, so the entire ward had to be recounted again, and the returning officer very generously paid for that recount out of his uh, bonus. Um, but I'm wondering if there's any, uh, see, it's a form of performance-related uh, pay in that in that situation. But I'm wondering if there's any, if there are any kind of sanctions that that, that could be mm. brought in in a situation where a returning officer has clearly, you know, mm. not not met the standard that's required, but is still getting a quite substantial bonus for running. Yeah, so making a determination between just genuine human error and um, something that's uh, quite significant. It, it, it's about who, responsibility at the end of the day and, and mm. the responsibility which is handsomely rewarded under the current structure of, of payments. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as part of the review, we have been looking at those aspects um, of the whole remuneration and responsibility in its entirety. So the points you make uh, are under consideration. Okay. I mean, that was a very, you know, thankfully isolated example, but it, it nevertheless was a very real one. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. And that's that's actually interesting. Um, uh, just to see where, where things stand and where they're going at the moment with that. Um, I think there's been a couple of things today, you know, where this is a work in progress. And yes. I'm happy to write to the committee and keep it updated as we progress these matters. And that'll be good. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. And uh, SPCB and Maureen. Maureen Watt, please. Thank you, convener. Um, on the 12th of November, <clears throat> we as a committee received a letter from the SC SPCB um, in relation to this bill and their concerns uh, about the, them having the accountability and responsibility uh, for the Electoral Commission and specifically uh, concerns related to budget and to the potential for overspend and auditing arrangements. So can I ask if the Scottish Government has reached an agreement with the SPCB uh, to resolve the, their outstanding concerns? Um, oh, Following off, when I picked up this bill, this was one of the first things that I noticed. Okay, the, the, and understood entirely the concerns that the SPCB uh, had raised. There has been detailed discussion ongoing with them. Um, I can't sit here today and say it's sorted yet. But I can say with some confidence it will be sorted. 
to their satisfaction and the satisfaction of anybody else with a relevant interest in it. So we will get this this uh, resolved, and as soon as we do, I'm happy to advise the committee of that. Okay, thank you. And just for anyone's uh, interest, SPCB is a Scottish parliamentary corporate body. Just uh, it was my fault for introducing it that way. So, um, but thank you for that. Um, just final uh, area of concern: um, electoral reform and. Um, one of the commissions is that electoral law should be consolidated. Um, for example, the committee heard electoral commission um, that outdated language used to describe criminal electoral offences um, made prosecution difficult. So the committee is mindful of the work of the law commissions in the UK, which recommended the consolidation of electoral law. Is the Scottish Government considering further work on modernising and consolidating uh, those areas of electoral law? So, Kavir, you, you, you correct to point to the kind of across UK um, working that has been had taken place uh, previously and we expect further findings uh, next year. Um, I think we would recognise entirely that there is a need for consolidation. In some respects, the work that's been done by this bill and the franchise bill is, is doing that. But there's clearly further, there's certainly a case for further consolidation work to be um, um, carried out. I mean, this particular bill is, is essentially a series of amendments to, to other legislation. Um, so that we would recognise there is a need to look at this from the perspective of Scottish electoral law in, in the coming years. So uh, I think there is a direction of travel there. Good. Okay, thank you. And just finally, um, is the Scottish Government considering the impact of any changes made in the Referendum Scotland Bill on this uh, Electoral Reform Bill? It, yes, is the answer. Right, OK. Any ideas or anything? Or just well, the, the, the referendum bill hasn't completed its passage yet. Yeah, well, indeed. I, I don't mean that as a flippant no, no, remark. No, I mean, no. clearly we have still stage three yeah. uh, to complete. And you don't but like in the light of that, we will um, uh, be taking a look at the situation. And again, I'm happy to, to keep the committee uh, updated on, on that. Sure. It'd be wrong to preempt anything that might come through. Oh, indeed. Anyway. OK, well, um, unless there's anything else from anyone... I think that's us, and I'd just like to thank uh, the Minister and his team for coming along today. And uh, that ends the public um, section of this meeting today. So if I could please have the room cleared. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. Thank you.